皆さんチャンネル登録をお願いします。The scripture for, for today's message is Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Saranga, Hiroka, Hapyonga, Ore Chamunga, Chabia, Yangsonga, Chungsonga, Onua, Jalteni, Igatun Gosel, Kumjal, Bodhi, Omnu, Nera. Amen. Amen. Kumbi Sunga de Chananga, Yonjuye. Gold Choir will offer up the anthem, and then s e n i o r Pastor will preach under the t- preach. Dear brothers and sisters, in Matthew chapter 25, we find the parable of the talents. A master gave his three slaves one talent, two talents, and five talents, respectively. The slave who received five talents traded with people, gaining an, ad- an additional five talents. The slave given two talents also gained two more talents. Both of them made it double. But the slave with one talent just buried it in the ground, failing to make any profit. The master praised and rewarded the slaves who gained two and five talents. He said, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But he rebuked the slave who just buried the one talent, saying, You wicked and lazy slave, and said, Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. Then he took his one talent and gave it to the slave who earned five additional talents. The slave who received two talents earned two more, and the one who received five talents earned five more. Now, if you were the master, to whom would you want to give the one talent? To the two-talent slave or to the five-talent slave? Probably, you'd like to give it to the two-talent slave, right? Many of you would. I also felt the same way as a novice believer. I wonder, why did the master give it to the five-talent slave, not to the two-talent slave? However, running my ministry, I realized that it was only natural that he did so. In assigning a duty to someone, I couldn't help but choose a person with many duties. Why? Even though he already has many, he is capable of carrying it out, but others are not as trustworthy. Let's say I give a duty to someone and he can't handle it. That shouldn't happen. That's why I'd rather give the duty to the one who has many duties and is willing to take it on by faith. So I could comprehend that biblical parable. God offers us opportunities to work for Him according to our talents. We should never have these opportunities buried in the ground. We have to fulfill them with all our strength, thereby benefiting the kingdom of God. So today, among the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, I will talk about faithfulness, the seventh fruit. Through this message, I pray that you will examine your heart once again and become precious workers who can be recognized by God as a good and faithful servant. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the dictionary defines faithfulness as the quality of being steadfast in affection or allegiance or firm in adherence to promises or in observance of duty. Also, out in the world, faithful people are considered praiseworthy or trustworthy. And those who are spiritually faithful are treasures in the kingdom of God, giving out a fragrant aroma. They emanate the aroma of a steadfast heart, the aroma of obedience like that of a work cow, and the aroma of trustworthy and faithful heart. If we give out such an aroma, 
our Lord will also see us as lovely and want us and want to give us a tight and loving hug. But the kind of faithfulness recognized by God differs from that of the worldly people. Just physically performing our duties well cannot be called spiritual faithfulness. Also, just because we pour all our passion into a particular area, that is not called complete faithfulness. Then, what kind of faithfulness is recognized by God? First, it is to do more than what is entrusted. When workers are paid for their work, we don't call them faithful just because they successfully finish their duties. Uh, we could say they completed their duties, but because they work for their wages, we cannot call them faithful. They just work for the wages they receive. But even among paid workers are those who do more than what they are paid. They don't work reluctantly and just think, I have to work at least as much as I get paid. They fulfill their duty with all their heart, mind, and soul, without sparing their time and money. For example, some Levi workers at this church do much more than they are entrusted. They work even after work hours or on holidays. Even while they don't work, they always have their duties on their mind. They don't just do what they are instructed, but they always think how they can do their job better to benefit the church and the church members. In addition, they devote their time and effort to take care of other souls while serving as cell leaders or small group leaders. Like this, doing more than what we are entrusted is faithfulness. Also, in bearing responsibility, those with the fruit of faithfulness do more than they, what they are responsible for. Take Moses, for example. He prayed to save the Israelites who committed sins at the risk of his own life. Actually, Moses' duty was to deliver them out of Egypt and guide them according to God's command. But while Moses carried out this duty, he didn't just obey in these, doing only what he was commanded to do. He hovered the heart of Father God and guided the people with all his love and sincerity. So, when his people committed sins, he lamented for them and was willing to take responsibility as if he himself was at fault. It was the same with the Apostle Paul, as we find in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He did not think, I tried my best to preach the gospel, but they didn't accept it, so I can't help it. I think you've already heard, it, uh, heard the confessions of these two individuals, but even though you hear it often, that alone doesn't guarantee that you cultivate faithfulness. Even those who profess to have faith and perform their duties well would react a different way in a situation like that of Moses. They would say, God, I did my best. I feel sorry for the people, but I terribly agonized while leading them. What they mean by that is, I did everything I had to do. They would be concerned about taking responsibility for their sins and receiving a rebuke. It's the same in all other areas. Those who are faithful will not just think, I've done enough, but they will do more than what they are entrusted with all their heart and sincerity. Whenever you made a wall of sin against God, I always laid the blame on myself. I prayed, Father God, I am to blame. It's because I didn't teach them well. Then Father God always told me, it's not, it's not your fault. You did your best to teach them. 
but they didn't listen to you and put it into action. It's not your fault. Even so, I prayed, it's my fault, please forgive them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, Paul said, I will most gladly spend and be expanded for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? This is the confession of Apostle Paul. In taking care of the souls, he didn't carry out his duties reluctantly or half-heartedly. He took great joy in fulfilling his duties to the point where he most gladly spent and was expanded. For the souls, he unsparingly devoted himself again and again. As he said, true faithfulness is doing more than what we are entrusted with joy and love in all our duties. Second, the faithfulness recognized by God is to be faithful in the church. Suppose somebody joined a gang and, this, and dedicated his life to his boss. Then, would God call him faithful? Of course not. God can recognize our faithfulness only when we are faithful in goodness and truth. Although you work hard, if it's for neither goodness nor truth, God doesn't call it faithfulness. The most crucial thing in being faithful in the truth is the circumcision of a heart. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 urges us, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Here, to be faithful until death doesn't, doesn't just mean to work faithfully until our physical life ends. It means to accomplish the Word of God in the 66 books of the Bible with all our life. First of all, we have to cast off sins to the point of shedding blood and keep God's commandments. As written in Hebrews, you should cast off sins to the point of shedding blood. This is faithfulness, casting off evil, sins, and untruth, which Father God detests most. This is the beginning of faithfulness. Without this, even if you physically work hard, Father God does not recognize it as faithfulness. Casting off every form of evil and untruth, keeping the commandments and resembling the Lord, this is the greatest faithfulness. If this is done, then your physical deeds are recognized as faithfulness. As Paul affirmed, I die daily. We have to completely put our flesh to death and become sanctified. This is spiritual faithfulness. Realizing that what Father God desires from us most is sanctification, we do our best in circumcising our hearts. Of course, it doesn't mean we shouldn't assume any duty before we become completely sanctified. I'm saying that whatever duty we have, we also have to achieve sanctification at the same time. Those who continually circumcise their hearts will remain unchanged in their faithfulness. Even in hardships or some trials of the heart, they won't let go of their pre precious duty. On the other hand, if we neglect the circumcision of our hearts, we could fail to keep our heart amidst temptations or hardships. We could forsake our relationship with God and give up our duty. In a year's period of time, some people do their duties diligently for a while and then take a break. They diligently work for some time, but then they disappear for months. Then, if they recover God's grace, they again work hard. This repeats again and again. 
Church workers who have ups and downs like this cannot be called faithful even if they work hard. To demonstrate faithfulness recognized by God, we should also have spiritual faithfulness by which we can cast off sins and evil. But circumcising our heart in itself is not paid back with rewards. Casting away sins does, isn't paid back with rewards. That's just what we have to do. Circumcision of heart is a must for the saved children of God. But if we cast up sins and fulfill our duties with a sanctified heart, we can bear incomparably greater fruit than the fruit we bear with the fleshly heart. In turn, we can build up greater rewards. Suppose you work hard all day long on the Lord's day, but you quarrel with some people. Breaking peace with them, you work with a grumbling heart. Then, how much of your heavenly rewards would be cut back? Your work may cut back your Uh, your work may cut back your reward rather than increasing it. Father God never wants peace to be broken. He does not want you to break peace no matter the occasion. Moreover, if you are a leader, you should never break peace. But if you serve the church with goodness and love while keeping peace, all your work will be an aroma acceptable by, to God and paid back with rewards. Even if no one's watching, you should stay faithful and pray. You, your mindset should be like this. But if you get hurt over trivial things, break peace and complain, then would it be good? It means you are narrow-minded and still far from spirit. You are boxed in with your self-righteousness and frameworks. A third, the faithfulness recognized by God is to work according to the Master's will. In church, we have to work according to God's heart and will. Also, we have to work obeying the we have to work obeying to the liking of our seniors whom we serve. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 13 says, Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send it, for he refreshes his soul of his masters. Even though a servant works diligently, he cannot satisfy his master if he works just as he pleases. Suppose His master directed him to clean up the house, but he goes out and labor on the field all day. Then, no matter how hard he works, he is not faithful. The reason why a person doesn't obey the master's will is, uh, you know what I'm saying? The master orders his servant to clean up the house, but the servant labors on the field all day long. He doesn't do what he was told. Then, no matter how hard he works, he is not a faithful servant. because he doesn't obey his master's will. The reason that people don't obey the master's will is that they either find their will not, not agreeing with their thoughts or have self-interest. Even though they seemingly serve their master, they don't, they don't work with a faithful heart. Back in King Sejong's reign, there was an official named m a l i c h e who always opposed the king in everything. He objected to the king's words. It would have been good if he had obeyed, but he had his self-righteousness and frameworks, which didn't agree with the king's. So he continually disobeyed and opposed the king. King Sejong was such a benevolent king, not knowing the truth. He had a heart of loving even his enemies. So he embraced even such an official because he also had merits. He appreciated them. Even though he defied the king and opposed whatever policy he suggested, the king appreciated and made use of his merits. So the king didn't drive him away. The king invented the Korean character in secret. In secret. The officials tried to find out what the king was doing in secret. 
they were sep- desperate to find out. So the king hid himself in a temple and created the Korean characters in a basement, in a secret place. There, he devoted himself to research. There were a few, in, a few officials who helped him, but they didn't really agree with what the king was doing. Even so, they figured out the king's good heart and tried to help. Maoli Che is known for his stubbornness, right? He was obstinate and didn't obey the king. If we had done so to other kings, he would have been fired or put to death. But the king Sezong forgave him and saw his merits. He considered his stubbornness as faithfulness. Why? Because he was doing what he thought was right on his part. For example, he tried to deter King Sejong from producing a celestial globe to observe the constellation. Because if China found out, the nation could be in big trouble. Producing it without permission from China could bring big trouble. China could attack. That's how he tried to deter the king by all means. Yet, King Sejong intended to produce it because it was essential for the well-being of his country and his people. So, m a o l i Che was doing what was right within his self-righteousness and frameworks. But, for the king's part, producing it was necessary for the future of the country and the people and for the country to become in- independent. There is n- the same went for the invention of Korean characters. If China found out that we intended to create our own characters, it could lead to conflict. So m a o l i Che tried to deter the king anyhow. For the king's part, people found it too difficult to learn the Chinese characters, so even when they suffered unfair situations, they couldn't file a complaint because they didn't know how to read a public announcement and how to write, they didn't know how, what to do. That's why the king intended to invest, uh, invent easy characters so that all his people can learn them. Even though the king had such good intentions, m a o l i Che couldn't accept it. No matter how many times the king explained, Che insisted on his way and tried to deter him anyhow. The king ended up Blind. As the king couldn't sleep well, researching day and night without resting, he became a blind man. After all, m a o l i Che himself left politics. No matter how hard he worked, it wasn't faithfulness. While he had to support the king's will, he only opposed him, even though he thought he did it for his country. It wasn't faithfulness. Do people with family named Che are obstinate like this? If you have such stubbornness, just throw it away quick. Back to the sermon. They only follow their thoughts and greed and could destroy, uh, disobey the master's will anyhow. In the Bible, we find a person named Joab who was a general of David's army. Joab stayed by David through all his trials. even while David was chased by his enemies. He protected his king all the time and shared joys and sorrows of life. So, he should have been recognized, right? Uh, With wisdom and bravery, he carried out the tasks David asked him to do. When Joab attacked the city of Ammonites and was about to conquer it, he let David come and take it himself. The city almost being uh, conquered, Joab himself could have marched into the city so that people could praise General Joab took the city. But to give all the credit to the king, when it was almost conquered, he had David come and take it. What a good heart, and what a good heart he seemed to have. Despite all this, he couldn't win recognition. He did not take the glory of conquering the city, 
but allowed David to take it. He served David so well this way, but David wasn't comfortable dealing with them because he didn't serve him from the depth of his heart. To achieve his goal, Joab did not hesitate to act rudely before David. When something was, wasn't to his benefit, he disobeyed David. For example, when the enemy general e f n e r came to David to surrender, David welcomed him and sent him back. Because David could win people's hearts without a battle. What a good opportunity this was. David could settle the public stance and sentiment by embracing them. But when Joab found out his fact later, he chased after Abner to kill him without letting King David know. Without letting King David know, Joab killed Abner because he slew his brother in a previous battle. While the king embraced Abner and his people, intending to put an end to the war, Joab went against his will to take revenge on his younger brother. Um, in the book, The Romance of Three Kingdoms, Liu Bei is known as a man of great virtue and goodness. He formed brotherly ties with Kuan Yu and Chang Fei. But in light of the truth, is he really a good man? Because uh, before I knew the truth, I thought of him as the nicest person, having only virtues. However, learning the truth, I found out that he wasn't so at all. Then, who is really a good person in the book? s h u k u r Liang and Xiao Yun were indeed good people. They obeyed until death, and even though they would suffer loss, they obeyed and served their king. However, Liu Bei wasn't so. To avenge his bro- younger brother, he raised an army of hundreds of thousands, not listening to his advisor. He committed a tactical error, leading 800,000 soldiers to death. Uh, it was done to take vengeance on his brother. So how could he be a man of virtue and goodness? He started a war that he shouldn't have started, causing damage to numerous people. He should have waged war after preparing enough provisions. But, consumed by his desire to revenge, he hastily raised an army of hundreds of thousands, leading them to death. He barely survived and came back with a few generals. Such things happened a few times. It was the same with Joab, who tried to avenge his brother. Although Joab knew that David would be in trouble if he killed Abner, he just followed his emotions. Also, when David's son rebelled, David asked the soldiers who were going out to fight to treat his son with kindness. Having heard this order, Joab killed Absalom. Joab could have had an excuse that if Absalom was left alone, he could rebel again. But after all, Joab disobeyed the king's order at will. Even though he went through all the difficult times with the king, he disobeyed him at such crucial moments, so David couldn't deal with him comfortably. Finally, Joab faced death as a result of rebelling against Solomon, David's son. Not obeying David's will, he intended to crown another person whom he liked as the king. David appointed Solomon, but Joab rebelled, trying to set up another person whom he liked as the king. Although Joab served David all throughout his life, he ended his life as a traitor, not a meritorious 
retainer. Fourth, the kind of faithfulness that God wants is being faithful in all His house. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, God says about Moses, He is faithful in all my household. To be faithful in all God's household means to be faithful in all the areas to which we belong. In church as well, we have to fulfill all our duties assigned to us. Even though we don't have an official duty in church, we have, to, we have a duty to be present where we are supposed to be present as a member. Not only in church, but in our families or our workplaces, we have our duties to fulfill. In all the areas we belong to, we have to do our duties as a member. Let's say cell leaders, sub-district leaders, and district leaders work faithfully for the church and the shepherd, but they don't take care of their family. Then we can't say they are faithful in all God's house. Father God wants you to be faithful in all His home, house. By being faithful in all God's house, Moses could meet God face to face. He was also a man most humble. Let's say you work hard in church, visit church members, and pray hard, but you don't take, care, take good care of your husband and your children. Coming home from work, your husband eats a meal that's turned cold. You say like, I'm going to church, your dinner is on the table, help yourself. This is how you treat your husband. You should arrive at home earlier and serve him with a fresh cooked meal. But you don't. Then, would God be pleased with this? You don't serve your husband well, making excuses of God. And you should raise your children well in the Lord. But you don't. Your children say, Mom, why are you always late? You say, because I'm working hard for God. Does it make sense? Do you think your children can understand this? Children want their mom to be with them and get them fresh meals or snacks. But if you do all what they want you to do, you can't work for God. I mean, you have to make them well understand your situation. Making them understand it, you have to work faithfully. But some of you cause your children to be upset about what you do. As you do so, your children may go astray and harbor complaints against you. My, they think, my friend's moms are so nice, but why isn't she? They should, shouldn't grow up with such complaints. So you should be faithful to your husband and your children. To be faithful in all God's house is to be faithful as a member or a leader of your church and as a member of your family, workplace, or school. You shouldn't be faithful in just one or two areas while neglecting others. You should be faithful in all areas. Is there anyone who thinks, while I have only one body, how could I possibly be faithful in all areas? However, to the extent that we cast off flesh and change in the spirit, it is not difficult to be faithful in all God's house. Even though we invest a little amount of time, we can surely reap the fruit of whatever we sow in spirit. Also, those who have changed into spirit pursue others' benefit and positions uh, first, rather than their benefit or comfort. Thus, such people take care of all areas, even if it involves their sacrifice. To the extent we go into spirit, our heart is filled with goodness, and good-hearted people don't incline to one side. Even if they have many duties, they wouldn't fulfill some duties well while neglecting others. They will do their best to take care of their surroundings, trying to pour more of your heart. Then people, around, uh, then people around them will feel truthfulness from their heart, so they wouldn't feel upset about 
their not being with them always, whether they will be thankful. For example, a person belongs to two groups. He is the leader in one group and an ordinary member in the other. If he has goodness and has borne fruit of faithfulness, he doesn't neglect either of the two. He wouldn't think, because I'm the leader here, they would understand my absence. Even if he cannot be present at meetings of the other group, he tries to be of any help in other ways possible. If he fails to do that, he feels sorry and apologetic before God and others. Like this, to the extent we have goodness, we can be faithful in all God's house and keep peace with all people. It's time to conclude today's message. Brothers and sisters, Joseph was sold as a slave into the house of Potiphar, the captain of the royal bodyguard. And Joseph was so faithful and trustworthy that Potiphar entrusted all his household affairs to him and didn't even check up on him. In the kingdom of God, we are in need of such workers in many areas. After I assign you some duty, if you carry it out so faithfully that I don't have to check up on you, then how greatly you will be of help to the kingdom of God. Even when serving his physical master, Joseph worked faithfully with faith in God. God didn't consider his service to be in vain, but blessed him to become the prime minister of Egypt. Moreover, our faithfulness in the Lord is for the kingdom of God and for the salvation of numerous souls. Therefore, what great rewards we will receive in heaven. Psalm chapter 101 verse 6 says, My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. I urge you to bear the fruit of faithfulness in heart and walk in the blameless way. I pray in our Lord's name that you will become workers who are like pillars in the kingdom of God and enjoy the glory of ministering to Him. Let's reflect on today's message in our prayer. それは命与える救い